All right, today we are going to talk about 4.7 overlapping and congruent triangles, and we're just going to continue our proof practice, but now the triangles will have some common part that will be overlapping. So first we're going to identify the common parts. There's two different problems. The first one says, what common angle to triangle ACD? So I always tell you to highlight, outline, see which triangles they're talking about because they're overlapping. There's several different triangles within that one diagram. And with triangle ECB, so I'm going to outline that triangle. So now that I have my two triangles, we can definitely see what common angle, since we're talking about angles, it has both the blue and the red. So right now you can see the angle C, okay, or yeah, angle C is our common angle. So when we do a proof, and this is one of our steps, angle C is congruent to angle C because of the reflexive property. So you're going to be seeing this property throughout all of our proofs today because they share either a common side or a common angle that's congruent to itself. Um, let's look at number two. There's two different questions. Um, the first one says, what is the common side to triangle A, B, D? So it's a little bit off there. But you see that? A, B, D, and D, C, A. So here's the first set of triangles that we're looking that are overlapping in that diagram. So hopefully you see the side that's over overlapping and side D, A is the same in both triangles right here. So that would be the reflexive property in that proof. I'm going to erase this and do the second one because it's talking about two other angles that are within this uh, figure. The first one says angle or triangle A, B, D. So that same one in the blue. But now we're going to be talking about triangle B, A, C. So when we look at these two, they have a different part in common. And hopefully you're now able to see that side B, A, is the common part for those two triangles. So definitely highlighting helps you. All right, so let's go ahead and write a proof. Always look at the given information, and the biggest suggestion we can give you is if it's overlapping, draw it out separately. Sometimes highlighting just isn't enough. So I'm gonna read all the information first. They tell us that QD is congruent to UA. If that's not already marked, I would mark it, but you see here that we've already marked QD congruent to UA. And then angle QDA is congruent to UAB. So QDA is this angle right here, and UAD is this angle right here. Okay. Um, if you can do this looking at it like this, that's great. If we want to overlap or redraw the pictures, we can. Because I'm trying to prove triangle QDA. All right, here's my lovely drawing of triangle QDA. With the markings that were already there, I've got QD has a tick mark on it and angle D has an arc. The other triangle is UAB, so I'll erase this in a second, but U, can you try that again? UAD, here's U, here's A, here's D. UA has a tick mark and angle A has a mark. Now, going back to what Ms. White said, if I overlap them in the actual picture with my two different colors, here's QAD and here's UAD, they, you should notice that DA has a reflexive side. It's shared between the two of them. So on my separate pictures, I can put that two tick marks on there. So looking at this picture, I've got everything planned out. I've got everything marked. I just need to put it in writing. Notice that this is side angle side and the same congruent statements over here so that's my proof in verbal form now let's put it in writing we've already got our given statement which you need to start with and then i'm going to follow it up with um, the reflexive side that we just came up with da is congruent to da reason is reflexive that's the only thing I added to my picture that wasn't already there. So now I can say we have enough information to write the proof statement. Triangle QDA is congruent to triangle UAD. And my reasoning we came up with was side, angle, side. All right, let's try another proof. Ooh, I see our favorite. 
Every time you see perpendicular, remember we talked about two extra steps actually follow. But what I'm going to start with first is looking at the two triangles we're trying to prove because there are tons of different triangles in that diagram. So I'm going to highlight P, R, S, okay, in the red, and I'm actually just going to redraw that to the side just like Ms. Hurst was doing so that we can kind of see what things are marked or what we can mark. And then triangle Q, R, I'm sorry, Q, S, R, go that way, is the other triangle that we're trying to mark or try to prove that's congruent. So let's take a look at what they give us in the given, because actually nothing is marked on our diagram. So let's read through the first given, make sure you write that down in your proof. It says QS is congruent to PR, and I'm gonna go ahead and mark it down here, PR and QS is here, because it's easier to mark than in this diagram from up here, because that's kind of hard to tell and mark. So I'm gonna just mark it on the two I separated. So we've taken, um, take away that just mark, there's nothing we can write, but let's take a look at our step two, which would be our perpendiculars, okay? It says PS is perpendicular to RS. So remember, when you see perpendicular, you can mark the 90 degree angle, and then the first step that follows is saying that they're right angles. So we're gonna say angle RSP is a right angle. Okay. And since there is a second statement here that is uh, perpendicular where it says QR and RS are perpendicular, I'm going to go ahead and mark that 90 and I can put that in the same step because it's the same reason. So angle QRS is a right angle. And hopefully you remember the reason for step two. The reason why we're allowed to mark that a right angle is because of the definition of perpendicular. And I'm just going to abbreviate here to save some time. All right, so now that we say that they're right angles because of the definition of perpendicular, the second step that always has to follow is now that we know that they're right angles, then we know that the measure of angle R S P is equal to the measure of angle Q, R, S, because we know that those equal 90 degrees. And remember, this is that weird reasoning. It's not a property or a definition or anything like that. It just states that all right angles are congruent. Okay, so those, and I'm just abbreviating here again. Those are those two steps, two and three, that follow the perpendicular. All right, so we've taken care of the two givens now. Okay, but looking at our two triangles that we have separated, that's not enough. We only have an angle and we have a side. So we need to make sure, I'll retrace this, our two triangles that were given to prove, we have that common side up there and hopefully you can tell that that side SR is congruent to SR. So we're gonna mark it and anytime you mark something, you gotta write it as a step. So SR, is congruent to SR by the reflexive property. Okay, so now looking at the way we marked our triangles, let's take a look. Remember, first check if you have a 90 degree angle, if we have a hypotenuse label, so we do have that marked in both. So we got an H, and then we have a leg here. So this is uh, the reason for HL. So let me squeeze this in down here. Let's restate the proof. Triangle PRS is congruent to triangle QSR, and that reason is HL. Okay, so that proof is done. We have one last proof that we would like you guys to go ahead and pause and then check to see afterwards if you got it right. Okay, so here is the right answer. If you notice, there's actually only one extra step, which is the reflexive property, because everything else is marked. So that would be angle, side, angle. All right, and so we're done for the day. When you have overlapping, just make sure you are paying attention for the reflexive property.